It's baffled scholars for two millennia. It is a puzzle made of multi-dimensional elements, an enigma with roots that reach back to the dawning of time, perhaps before. Daniel explained part of it. Ezekiel and Isaiah had glimpses into it. John saw it all for the time of the end. That time is now. Join Derek and Sharon Gilbert on a journey that spans the course of history, from Eden to Mount Hermon, from Hermon to Babel, from Babel to Rome, from Rome to the cross, and from there to us. Biblical prophecy is coming true before your eyes, and to understand it, you must discern the times both then and now. It's time to unravel the threads of this all-encompassing prophetic paradox. It's time to unravel Revelation. Welcome to Unraveling Revelation from Skywatch TV. I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert. Um, Riders of Chaos. I, book title. <laughs> totally a book title. Peyton I'm stealing pending. it. Patent pending. No, mine. Oh. Mine. I thought of it first. Ha, ha, ha. You heard it first. Um, yes, indeed. We are seeing so much going on. And we're going to talk, this program is all going to be about chaos and what's going on and how this relates to Unraveling Revelation. But before we do that, I want to thank David W. Lowe for being our guest the last two weeks. His explanations for what I think is an, a really groundbreaking interpretation mm. of the seals. I, I feel so persuaded by that. Yeah. As we mentioned last week that uh, a number of our, our friends have, uh, who, who are fellow travelers in this, yeah. these studies have uh, cited Earthquake Resurrection as a very influential book in helping to make sense of the timing of the seals yeah. and placing them in a, in a proper historic context, which again, when you realize that uh, in, Revelation 4, in Revelation 5, when the Lamb who was slain, which is Jesus, mm -hmm. appears in the throne room of mm -hmm. God and immediately takes that seven-sealed scroll yes. and begins opening them. Yes. It makes a lot of sense of history, the um, turmoil mm -hmm. and tribulation that we've seen in mm -hmm. this world, uh, especially the chaos that we're seeing right now, uh, and the, 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 the realization that we are living in the middle of the book of Revelation. Yeah. Or, well, towards the beginning of it anyway, but we're, we're living in prophetic times. I think, uh, well, if indeed we're right about the... Uh, our interpretation that the writers began in the first century, then beginning with Paul and the many apostles who were spreading the gospel message, Paul believed that the Lord was going to return in his lifetime. Mm -hmm. The disciples seemed to think that they were very close to it. Um, in Matthew 24, and I think it was Mark 14, or but, but the, the parallel uh, chapter in Mark where they ask, what are the signs and how long? Mm -hmm. And what they were asking about was until the end of the age. Now, what they were asking specifically, I believe, was when's that last, the 70th week going to start? Mm -hmm. And when does it end? Because once it starts, seven years, yeah. we're done. Yeah. Has it started, sir? <laughs> they surely would have known that uh, the, the, the prophetic uh, teachings of Daniel and mm -hmm. the, the 70 weeks and uh, trying to figure out when that last week began. Yeah, uh, because it wasn't clear. The idea that Messiah is cut off, right. they might have just ignored the cut off part mm -hmm. and thought, hey, Messiah is here. Then that's 69 weeks. Okay, 70th week is sometime right after that, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they may have seen it as beginning almost immediately. Right, um, but not understanding that the 70th week was, was going to be a, a really, really difficult time. Uh, the idea of the... the, the catching away of the church was mm -hmm. something that was being revealed in that time frame. Yeah. And it's understandable because God, as we've discussed before, being the, the Yahweh of armies, the Lord of hosts, yeah. only reveals his plans to a point because yes. he doesn't reveal his everything to the enemy. Exactly. But and oh, I was just going to say that we see chaos emerging in the book of Revelation, as those seals are broken, we see those riders coming out, and they bring chaotic events. That second rider is, I mean, he's a rider of mayhem. Yes. It's not strategic, very clean, precision warfare. It's butchering. Right. And this is something that we're working on for a book that is uh, going to be out probably by the end of summer, if not sooner, I yeah. think, or maybe early fall. But uh, 
looking at the four riders of the apocalypse and uh, applying the divine counsel research of Dr. Michael Heiser to these entities. And if you watched our previous program on the rider on the red horse, you'll know where we're going with this. Mars, Aries, Chemosh to the Moabites mm -hmm. was an entity that was not, in Greek and Roman religion, uh, Athena and her, her corresponding um, uh, uh, in, in Minerva, Roman, Minerva wa was a goddess of war, but one of strategic yes. war, whereas yeah. Ares, Mars, was the god of just wanton slaughter mm -hmm. and mayhem, which is why it's so interesting when you go back further in history to the Moabite stone found by Dr. Sir Charles Warren. Charles, uh, yep. Yes, Sir Charles Warren. Uh, that on the Moabite stone, the king of Moab, uh, Mesha, who fought against Jehoshaphat and the son of Ahab, whose name I can't remember off the top of my head, Jehoram, I think, um, equated Chemosh, the national god of Moab, the war god, with Athtar, that was the male aspect of Inanna, Ishtar. Ishtar, Inanna, Ishtar right, yes. who was also a goddess of carnality, but yes. of mindless slaughter. Exactly. Chaos. Inanna is exactly like that. Right. And she represents herself not only as the queen of heaven, but mm -hmm. also the bull of heaven. And getting into that bull imagery, uh, I've been reading a, a mystery novel that is, uh, it's really, really well written and uh, came out in around 2007 or so, I think. But uh, this looks at Vienna and activities that are similar to Jack the Ripper. And since I write, you know, in that time period, this begins in 1902. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that's being written into the storyline is a German um, identity organization that is plotting various activities that are chaotic. And they have a sigil that they use that is called the UR, U -R. Mm -hmm. and it looks a bit like a... Uh, sort of if you, if you took a door and leaned it yeah. slightly, skewed it, mm -hmm. misshapen door, and it represents two things. It represents water as in rain. So think of the rain god, the storm god. Mm -hmm. But it also represents a part of the name Orox, ah, Orox mm -hmm. for bull. Right, right. That was the uh, archaic form of cattle, mm -hmm. huge, which was very uh, common in the ancient Near East and in Europe. I mm -hmm. think the last one died in the early 16th century, but uh, they were like six foot at the shoulder, and there are breeders trying to recreate it now. But They're uh, very, very big cattle, the, and it's not something you want to mess with. No, the, and the point was that using them to represent strength and fertility mm -hmm. was common in the ancient world. But when you look at Ezekiel's description of the caravine, and uh, when you compare Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 10 and understand that the face of the, the cherub, the carav, was identical to the face of the ox, which would have been the aurochs. yes that that was the face of the carob. And so those giant lamasu, those giant statues, winged bull creatures with lion's feet. Yes, we'll put a picture in here when Derek edits it because we, you stood behind, beside one of those. Yeah, They're at big. The British Museum. This was outside the palace at uh, Nineveh in the Assyrian kingdom. But if you notice and look closely, you see that all four elements of the carob, the caravim are in these lamasu. Yes. Bull, human, ox, or well, ox, human, uh, uh, eagle yeah, and, yeah. and they're, lion. They're essentially griffins. Right, yes. And so that is very likely what the caravine looked like, not the uh, sort of effeminate forms that we've seen in medieval paintings. Yeah. Certainly not the chubby little babies. No. But the, the, the point here is that uh, as we've been researching that forthcoming book um, for 2021, likely, on uh, what we call Prisoner Zero, yeah. uh, the original rebel in the Bible, which was not the, 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 the Nakash, the serpent in Eden, but chaos, the deep, to home in Genesis mm -hmm. 1, verse 2. The Spirit of God hovers over the deep. Uh, to home, Tiamat, that's a reference to Leviathan or chaos. Uh, and there are a number of references that uh, we find in, in uh, Job 41 especially, mm -hmm. but also in the Psalms and Isaiah. And, uh, and I go through all of those in my mm -hmm. presentation for the forthcoming Battle Ready Conference based on the research that we've been doing for this book, when we see that God subdued chaos, you know, crushed its heads, uh, gave it for food in the, in the, for beasts in the wilderness, etc., other references through the Old Testament, but it's not destroyed yet, and it won't be destroyed until 
Revelation 21, 1, when there's a new heaven and a new earth, and the sea is, is no, no more. more. Praise God. Do you know that that story of a serpentine, original, uh, primordial god or goddess um, is also part of the Aztec religion? I did not. And it's the same story. Someone came along and div divided it up, slew this great creature that was uh, underneath the primordial waters when there was no land, and it became the land. They divided this creature up and, and made what we call continents from mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. That is really interesting, because that's a consistent story in the ancient Near East, but for well, that story to be transplanted to the New it's World. It's part of Mithras. He slew the bull, the Orox bull, and it's part of the Tauroctony, and from that he created all life. Huh. Very interesting. A common thread, and not a coincidence that these disparate, these di religions from different parts of the world have so many it's similarities and parallels. been hiding in plain sight the whole time. Order out of chaos. Yeah. Well, we'll connect that to the writers of Revelation because we believe these writers are actually agents of chaos, the entity that is still at this point restrained, but not defeated, not destroyed. When Unraveling Revelation continues... Thousands of years ago, giants walked the earth. They're long gone, but their spirits remain. The evidence is there for those with eyes to see. Megalithic tombs. Monuments aligned with the stars. And the words of the prophets and apostles recorded in scripture. Now, see this evidence for yourself as Skywatch TV's Derek and Sharon Gilbert take you on a tour of the Holy Land with special guests, Pastor Carl Gallops and Messianic Rabbi Zev Porat, from the mountain where the story began to the mountain where it all ends. Wars of the Gods, Volume 2, Search for the Rephaim, available now in DVD and high-definition streaming video from Defender Films and Skywatch TV. Welcome back to Unraveling Revelation from Skywatch TV. I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert, and uh, I want to remind you of a couple of things. One is we really, really would love for you to join us next April in Israel. That's right. It's a once-in-a-lifetime thing, but, you know, many of the folks who've gone with us, they go back with us again. So uh, it, it could be a twice-in-a-lifetime or a thrice-in-a-lifetime. Or we had one lady who said, this is my 12th trip to Israel. Wow, wow. Why? Because once you go, you want to go again and again and again. Yeah. We will see sites that most tours won't visit. Not only do we go to the places in Judea and Samaria that are so important to uh, biblical history, it's, it's what the world calls the West Bank, but 80% yeah. of biblical history took place in Judea and Samaria. And so if you don't go there, you miss Joshua's altar, Bethel, Shiloh, all key mm -hmm. in, in uh, Israel's history. We'll also see... We pray, and this, this, uh, we had to miss this last time because of uh, the timing of getting up to Joshua's altar, uh, the, uh, the footprint at the Argamon. Oh, I so want to see that. Yes, so the, the Gilgal that. at Argamon. But speaking of Gilgal, Gilgal Rephaim in the Golan Heights, that uh, ancient megalithic site, older and bigger than Stonehenge, and now the Serpent Mound of Bashan, which is right next door to Gilgal Rephaim. You will be the first tour group to actually walk that serpent. Yeah. And no we'll, one else has done it. And we'll explain why it's important. Donna Howell and Allie Anderson Henson from Skywatch TV will join us. Messianic Rabbi Zev Porat will show us the actual historical sites of the crucifixion and the burial tomb. So the crucifixion and the resurrection and of Jesus. one of the places we're going is down in the area that, uh, where Jesus Christ Superstar, the film, oh, yes, was yes, made. Yes. So it's this Nabataean uh, area that's it's really, really interesting. Both Ali sing, and uh, Donna sing, Derek sings, I sing. And if you sing, come join us, and we will all sing in that spot. Yeah, Ovdat, down in the Negev. And the optional four-day extension over to uh, Jordan. You don't want to miss that because we'll go to Mount Nebo, and from there we can see... The Valley of the Travelers, where Ezekiel prophesies the last battle of the age, the War of Gog and Magog. You can also see this historic site of Sodom from Mount Nebo. And then, of course, Petra. Petra it's, is a once-in-a-lifetime. It's incredible. Yeah. So, so go to Skywatch in Israel. 
dot com. Mm -hmm. It will take you to the Lip Contours page, which has right. lots and lots of numbers and symbols and stuff. So just go skywatching. Sample itineraries and all the costs and stuff. It'll yeah. all be there. The second thing I want to make sure that I say to you is buy this book. This book was published in 2011 through Defender Publishing, and it's a multi-author book that has several authors contributing who have now passed on and they've gone to glory. Trust me, this book, Pandemonium's Engine, is one you want in your library. Dr. Missler, uh, the late Chris Putnam, the late Noah Hutchings, mm. all contributed to this. Dr. Tom Horn, you, I. I mean, it's got a lot of, lot of stuff in it, and it will inform you as nine years ago, many of the things you're now seeing take place were discussed. Yeah, I've got to go back and read that again. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So call the skywatchtvstore.com. It's 844-750-4985 or go to skywatchtvstore.com and order it. Sixteen ninety-five yep. plus shipping. Well, uh, signs of the end of the age in Matthew 24, which is a verse or a section of scripture that uh, a lot of prophecy scholars have studied. We see beginning at verse five, many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and they will lead many astray and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed for this must take place, but the end is not yet for nation will rise against nation. And what we're seeing there is uh, when we hear the word nation in English, we think of a geopolitical entity. With little dotted lines around it. Exactly. But the word in Greek is ethnos which is the word from which we get ethnicity. It's tribes. It's tribes. It's people groups. And yes. we're certainly seeing that on the streets of our exactly. United States. Exactly. That means that you're going to see, frankly, civil war. Yep. Oh. Uncivil. I don't know that it's civil at all. Right. But uh, we are seeing that take place. And it's the idea that when those seals are broken, chaotic events begin. Mm -hmm. So that is another reason that I really feel that it started in the first century. Yep. Kingdom against kingdom, famines, and earthquakes in various places. All of these are referenced essentially in Revelation mm -hmm. 6, with the exception of pestilence. Um, but we, uh, we uh, again, is, as Jesus said, this is the but the beginning of the birth pains. Mm -hmm. The end is not yet. Yes, but you know that, that uh, the fourth rider is killing with everything. Yeah. He's got every weapon at his disposal. And that is... Uh, a, again, a reflection of the, the spirit that is behind all of these writers. Um, the direction we're going, and this is maybe a spoiler for the book, but we'll, we'll go into more detail when, when Prisoner Zero is published in 2021, God mm -hmm. willing, that um, given that God spoke the universe into existence, God created everything. And we see this in John 1, where in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Colossians 1.17 makes clear that Jesus holds all things together. He is order. Mm -hmm. He created it. He is or he holds it together. Mm -hmm. So th this force of chaos, this primordial monster that wants everything to be everything and nothing at the same time. Well, we see it in Psalm 2. Why do the heathen rage? The word there is actually Goyim. Why mm -hmm. did the nations rage? Right. The tribes. And the people imagine a vain thing. They're imagining something. This is chaos magic. Um, because chaos magic, the essential rule is you can do whatever spell you want. You can do use whatever ritual mm -hmm. you want. You can call upon whatever God. But if you believe it will happen, it will happen. It's mm -hmm. the Tinkerbell right. theory. But... <laughs> <laughs> or Tad Cooper. <laughs> yeah, I super believe in you, Tad Cooper. Yeah, the, uh, the irony in all of this is that uh, for more than half a century, based on the, the earlier occult teachings of Aleister Crowley, who developed his Telemic system in the early part of the 20th century, his personal assistant and secretary, Kenneth Grant, mm -hmm. took it further because he said he, he, said he discerned the, a, a set Sirius current there, and set is a reference to the Egyptian chaos god, uh, Sirius being the star Sirius. He developed what he, uh, Crowley's magical system into what he called the uh, Typhonian order. And mm -hmm. Typhon is a reference to the Greek chaos monster, and his name Typhon, scholars believe, derives from the name of the mountain, Tsephon, where Baal's palace was located, yes. uh, which not coincidentally is also... Translated in English as the heights of the north, sides of the north, the uttermost north. We see that in Isaiah 14 and also Ezekiel 38 and 39. 
It connects the mountain sacred to mm -hmm. Baal, Lucifer, Satan, to Gog and Magog, the final battle. Yes. And, and you know, Kenneth Grant, he, he pops up in a lot of things. There, uh, there is a wonderful trio of books. It's nonfiction and it is not Christian, mm -hmm. but it is really good research by uh, Peter Lavenda, yes. Sinister Forces. Mm -hmm. And he takes a look at this and the idea of the nine and uh, the chaos magic and how it even, I, I often refer to this as the six degrees of Charles Manson mm -hmm. because in these books, he connects so many things mm -hmm. to Charles Manson. It's like they all converge on him. And that's what he believed. Mm -hmm. He believed that there was an uprising coming that it was going to be a tribal war, a race war, and he called it Helter Skelter. He believed that the Beatles' White Album was literally talking to him and telling him to go out and do these things. Yeah, and let me add a fourth book by Peter Lavenda that uh, was very influential. In fact, Josh Peck and I devoted quite a bit of our book, The, uh, the Day the Earth Stands Still, to the research of Lavenda in his book, The Dark Lord, H.P. Lovecraft, Kenneth Grant, and the oh, Typhonian yes. Tradition in Magic. Yes, it Again, is not good. written from a Christian perspective, uh, available on Kindle. Um, hardcover is rather expensive, but the, the research, again, we kind of distill down in our book, The Day the Earth Stands Still, because of Grant taking the research, the, the well, not the research, but the, the occult system of Crowley and developing it. But the reason Grant, as part of Grant's teachings. He was convinced that Alistair Crowley and the horror fiction author H.P. Lovecraft had been drawing inspiration from the same spiritual sources, even though Lovecraft claimed to be an atheist. Mm -hmm. He swore he was an atheist, didn't believe in it, but something was inspiring him to write yes. the fictional stuff that he wrote. And there are, it's too long to explain here, but there are some strange parallels between the fiction of Lovecraft and the occult teachings of Crowley that are highly improbable unless they were hearing from the same supernatural source. Lovecraft had a character, a monstrous character, called Cthulhu. Mm -hmm. And he, it's actually named sort of a Sumerian ending, and it's right. got the Chthonic element within it, which means a primordial, right. a very early creative god. Um, and this it's the dreaming monster at the bottom of the sea. He's dead but dreaming. And when the stars align correctly, he will awaken and the, dark, the, the great old ones will return. And uh, so the, the book, The Dark Lord by Peter Lavenda, is about how Grant was trying to develop a system of magic, chaos magic, to control this force of chaos. But, um, and as Josh and I pointed out in the book, ironically, the two main and in fact, I talk about this in my upcoming presentation for the Battle Ready Conference. The two main efforts to try to contact life in outer space, extraterrestrial life, search for extraterrestrial intelligence and the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence. The acronyms for both essentially are pronounced SETI. Yes. SET was the Egyptian chaos god. Mm -hmm. SETI means man of SET. So both of these efforts that are beaming signals into outer space to try to contact whatever's out there are both called Man of the Chaos God. Odd. Yeah, probably fine. Oh, it's probably yeah. fine, But yes. this is not a coincidence because it relates to what we're seeing today. And as Peter Lavenda points out in The Dark Lord, Cthulhu, Lovecraft's creation, in uh, Sumerian essentially means Man of Kutha, which was the ancient city that was sacred to the god of the underworld, Nergal, i.e. Reshef or Apollo, who we argue was the rider on the white horse. Now, isn't that interesting? Yeah. In fact, Kutha is mentioned in the Old Testament, that people had settled from, uh, been resettled by the Assyrians. But, uh, yeah, mm. but that was the city that was sacred to Nergal. That, that, well, let me continue with Psalm 2. When you get to, uh, well, we'll repeat again. Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, they're all sitting down at a table, and the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh, against the Lord, and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Who's the, who are they referring to? God and Yeshua, mm -hmm. our Savior, the anointed because they are trying to break away. They're trying to stop that order that he's holding all things together. They want chaos. But uh, God is uh, 
Well, again, we see in verse four, he who sits in the heavens laughs and the Lord holds them in derision. He does, yeah. but he's not going to laugh for long and he's all out of bubble gum. <laughs> That's right. When he comes back, he will be leading the army that basically puts mm-hmm. an end to it. And it will be an ending that it will be as quick as we see in Genesis 1, verse 2. The big difference in the way chaos is subdued in the Bible versus the way it's subdued in all of these other pagan religions is that the, the gods, the warrior gods who had to defeat chaos needed help to do it. It was a difficult task. Sometimes they, they almost lost. Zeus was overpowered by Typhon, was only, uh, only was victorious when, uh, uh, I think it was Pan, stole the sinews that had been taken from his legs by Typhon oh, yes, yes. and restored them to Zeus so that yes. he could wind up winning the battle. Yes. But it, that's, that's the thing. Baal needed special clubs that were made for him by the craftsman god. Couldn't do it on his own. Ninurta needed help. Hey, and Lil ne- with a word. Help. Right. That's I want to remind you, before we leave, and I know we're running out of time, uh, we mentioned the Battle Ready Conference. We've both presented uh, recorded presentations for that. You can still sign up to stream it. And believe me, this is something you are going to want to watch because we just found out that our good, good friend, Skywatch TV author, Defender author, right. and he's on, uh, you just, in fact, he was just on again with his wife, Drew Graffia, mm-hmm. the author of The, the Warrior, Priest, Warrior Concept. Priest Concept. Oh my gosh, you so have to read that book. He is going to be speaking too. And th- even though this is a virtual conference, there will be virtual um, meeting rooms where you can talk to us. The guy who's putting it together, Adrian Appleberry, he is an IT genius. And he has guaranteed that this is going to be quite an experience, unlike anything you've ever ever known. So sign up for this. Go to battlereadyconference.org, battlereadyconference.org. You'll see Brandon Gallops, Russ Dizdar, L.A. Marzulli, Casper McLeod. You and I will be there. Drew Graffia, Mm -hmm. Jamie Walden. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah, this is going to be quite a uh, gathering. And Ryan Peterson. Ryan Peterson, too? Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. Well, and Brandon Gallops. Not just Carl, but Brandon. Well, we need somebody to keep Carl in line. If we could just get, you know, Hannah. Bre- Hannah. Yeah. Hannah is the one. She holds everything together <laughs> when it comes to the Gallops also. Because Carl, he's, he's pretty chaotic. I mean, he's not going, you know, the chaos side. But no, he but, leaves, you know. He leans that way sometimes. Oh, we love Carl <laughs> It's because so Carl much. loves people and he talks to everybody. He, he needs somebody to... Ca- Carl, time to Carl, get on the bus. <laughs> yeah. Well, in the end, God restores order to all things. Uh, he is not a God of disorder or of chaos. And praise God for that. Amen. Thank you for watching. This is Unraveling Revelation from Skywatch TV.